When you find a Marine who's got the Congressional Medal of Honor, and later, completely separate action, received the Navy Cross, you got a pretty good hero in your hand. And that was John Vassilow. In times of peace, the warrior spirit rests quietly among us. When war comes, this warrior spirit, the resolve to kill and to face death in combat, is awakened. It is always the young who bear the greatest burden of this resolve. It is the young who must find the courage to fight and perhaps to die in defense of their nation. It is the young who are called to follow the warrior spirit on its dangerous path. Those who survive sometimes return to their people. They may become the heroes and legends of history and live to become old men. There are others who don't return. They too may become heroes among their people. They may be remembered through works of art and stories of their sacrifice for many generations. And there are still others, rare individuals, who survive but know they cannot return. Destiny has prepared only one path for them, the warrior's path. If they stray from this path, they are lost. John Bassalone was one of these rare young men. Even as a boy, he had a premonition of his warrior's destiny. Later on as a young man, he again saw his future. This time it was a clearer vision. He saw that his future was to be in combat. A third time as a young hero, a Medal of Honor veteran of the bloody fighting on Guadalcanal, he saw the final vision of his future. He foresaw his own death in battle. This final premonition did not slow him down or divert him from his mission on the warrior's path. Just the opposite. His mission, to lead and protect young Marines in battle, became more urgent. His family and even his commanding officers begged him to stay home and enjoy his well-deserved status as a war hero. He told them simply, I'm staying with my boys. They need me. He returned to combat at Iwo Jima. It was a one-sided war. Japan, an ancient maritime nation with one of the most powerful navies in the world, had taken the American Navy by complete surprise. Newspaper headlines screamed with the nation's pain and fury. Women wept in the streets, and strong men listened, motionless with shock, as news of the carnage unfolded like a waking nightmare. Japan had destroyed a large part of America's Pacific fleet as it lay at anchor. 2,403 Americans died in the attack, many in their sleep. In just under two hours, America's Pacific Fleet went to the bottom. This was just the beginning. With its enemy in the Pacific nearly defenseless, Japan began its war of conquest, rampaging across the Pacific, taking the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, and French Indochina, today's Vietnam, in rapid succession. It had taken Japan over 100 years to avenge an American insult. In 1853, U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry sailed heavily armored warships into Tokyo Harbor and dropped anchor unannounced and uninvited. This was a turning point in Japanese history. It forced the isolationist empire to admit it was weak and vulnerable to armed attack. The proud samurai swordsmen were suddenly as defenseless as children before the Americans. The response of the Japanese merchant class was fierce. They devoted themselves to the study of modern mechanized warfare. They seized nearly every aspect of Japanese society in their grip. Never again would Japan tremble before another nation. From now on, other nations would tremble before Japan. In 1931, Japan's terrifying rage of conquest was restricted to Asia. But on the far end of the world, a young American boy had a startling vision. At the time, he was working as a caddy at the Raritan Country Club in Raritan, New Jersey. He was standing on a fairway in the early morning. His party of golfers were up on the putting green measuring their shots and chatting endlessly. He knew the men well, having caddied for them several times. As he watched the men play, he had a vision that changed his life and the future of his nation forever. This young visionary's name was John Francis Bassalone. 
I remember Johnny as a young boy, we used to all play together. We were ten children. Oh, we played games and things like that. I was the boss. I was. I was the oldest. <laughs> he was always lively. He was, he was a good kid because he was always smiley. He was happy-go-lucky type. He was a great kid. Johnny really was. Young John Bassalone saw a vision of conflict with the Japanese. And although it wasn't clear what the problem would be, the vision, he believed, was a clear and urgent message. Most of the guys used to like the caddy for the Japs because they gave the best tip, see? But Johnny sort of, we were talking, you know, we were just talking about this. I said, I don't know, I don't trust it. <laughs> but he got it for him, though. That evening at home, he mentioned the impression to his sister Phyllis and his brother Carlo. He was dismissed as a wild dreamer with too much imagination. It was the first of three distinct visions John Bassalone saw during his life. Each one was more specific and frightening than the last, and each one proved to be true. He believed, like the biblical saints in the Bible, that the visions were intended to guide him on his life's path. In 1930s America, no one dreamed the Japanese would attempt to cross the largest ocean in the world and attack the United States. No one but 17-year-old John Bass alone. John was outgoing and athletic. He lived the life of a carefree country boy among the open fields and wide streams of rural New Jersey. As well as being physically strong, he was strong-willed, often taking the lead in the endless rough-and-tumble games among the other children of Raritan. He began to believe that he could accomplish anything. He believed so completely in his willpower, he decided to make a pet of a thousand-pound bull that had nearly killed several people who had wandered into his field of sight. He learned an important lesson about power after the bull charged him, caught him between his horns, and threw him 20 feet through the air. John escaped undamaged, except for his self-confidence. John Bassalone never seemed to adjust to being indoors. He could run all day, but couldn't sit still at his desk at St. Bernard's parochial school. He also couldn't stop talking in class. When told by the nuns they were going to take away 10 points for his behavior, he replied, take them all away. He managed, some say with a generous push from his teachers, to graduate from the eighth grade. By that time, it was obvious to John that school was not a place where he could succeed. At the age of 15, he confided to his father that he was through with school. He was determined to get a job. The year was 1932. The Great Depression had destroyed much of the world's economy. As winter arrived and work at the golf course dwindled, he spent his days idling around the shops and businesses of Raritan, hoping something else might turn up. Nothing did. At this critical turning point in John Bassalone's life, a mentor came to his aid and proved to be a critical influence. Father Amadeo Russo, the local Roman Catholic priest of St. Anne's Church in Raritan, counseled John to trust in God and believe that his path would be shown to him in time. It was difficult advice for John. Patience had never been a part of his character, but Father Russo saw clearly it would be the one trait that the young man would need more than any other. After a period of working at dead-end jobs, John enlisted in the Army and was assigned for training at Fort Jay in New York Harbor. From his first day, he knew he had found his place. He had never been happier than he was with his fellow soldiers away from the confines of small-town life. Even the Army discipline appealed to him, and for the first time in his life, he rose to the top of his class. After basic training, the machine gun became his specialty specifically the Browning 30 caliber 1917A. It was a water-cooled weapon that was so heavy it required three men to carry it with its ammunition or two with a caisson to roll it. The men nicknamed it the Heavy. For John, the Heavy was pure lightning and he adopted the machine almost as a part of himself. He felt this way since the first time he saw them rolled out for instruction. He became so adept at assembling and disassembling the guns blindfolded that he took all bets that he could beat anyone at it. The legend is that he never lost a bet. With his movie star good looks and devil-may-care attitude, young John Bassalone soon got a reputation among his barracks mates as a good-time guy who attracted a lot of female attention. Suddenly, not only was he at the top of his class of machine gunners, he was also the most popular. In the 1930s, America was isolationist. 
There were calls in Congress to reduce the army and retreat within our borders. Even the rape of Asia by Japan was ignored. It didn't concern America. Soldiers were not respected in many parts of the country, and John Bass alone got his share of the scorn laid on men in uniform. Many Americans thought that soldiers were just government thugs hired to break the back of the popular workers' rights movement. It was during this time that John Bass alone began to build a reputation as someone who didn't back down when it came to a fight. In 1935, John boarded a cross-country train with his blood brothers of the 16th Infantry Division, bound for California. The Army was shipping them to their first post, the Philippines. It was a week-long trip of non-stop drinking and gambling. There was no place to lie down. Soldiers were expected to sleep sitting up. It was John's first look at the country beyond New Jersey and New York. It was the beginning of his travels west towards his destiny in the Pacific that would consume the rest of his life. The trip to Manila was on board the USS Republic and took over a week. It was his first time at sea, and he was filled with anticipation of seeing the exotic place he had heard so much about. It is not known exactly when, but at some time during the trip, or shortly after arriving in the Philippines, John Bassalone began his second specialty in the Army, boxing. Over the course of his two-year deployment in the Philippines, John Bassalone fought as a light heavyweight in 19 bouts, winning all of them. The soldiers of the Philippines christened him Manila John, and the first part of his legend came to be. The details remain sketchy, but John was rumored to have fallen in love with a local beauty named Lolita. The picture emerges through men who knew him later in life, of young John Bassalone blowing off the frustration of his army life with wild nights of drinking, gambling, and romance with his beautiful girlfriend. The only evidence we have of Lolita are references to her in the memoirs of John's sister Phyllis and the tattoo on his right arm of a beautiful Spanish lady. In spite of all the distractions and entertainments of garrison life, the one thing John Bassalone couldn't ignore was the standing orders of all American forces in the Philippines. By 1935, the threat to American interests in the Pacific region was becoming clear. Japan had invaded and annexed Manchuria, adding the region to its other conquests in China and Korea. It had signed a cooperation agreement, the anti comintern Pact with Germany and later Italy, formalizing what was to become the three Axis powers during World War II. In response to this growing threat from Japan, the standing orders to all American forces in the Philippines were to retreat at any sign of Japanese hostilities. This was demoralizing to many young soldiers, but to John Bass alone, it was more than that. It was shameful. Then came the most difficult time in this young man's life. He thought he had found the path he was destined for, but it had led to a dead end. He began a period of personal anguish back in Raritan. He had lost his way. He left the army at the end of his first tour of duty, determined never to return. For a time, he worked at a local laundry, delivering diapers to housewives and uniforms to businesses in the area. His friends from school had all gone on to careers, to raise families and some even to college. He was a failure, he thought, a fool who had thought he could make his way in the world. Now he was back living in his parents' house and would be lucky to deliver diapers for the rest of his life. His sense of helplessness was overwhelming. To ease his mind, he retreated to familiar territory. He spent hours playing golf at the Raritan Country Club, sifting his thoughts as he walked the long fairways. It was there, near the spot where he was seized by his first premonition about having trouble with the Japanese, that his second vision happened. But this time, the details were clearer. He saw clearly that there would be war with the Japanese. Again, he confided in his eldest brother, Carlo. This time, he was not rebuffed as a youngster with an overactive imagination. But John was at war with himself. His sister, Phyllis, who had always watched out for her troubled younger brother, invited him to stay with her in Reisterstown, Maryland, a suburb of Baltimore. Normally, John made friends easily. He was always surrounded with a group ready for fun, but not now. He spent most of his free time taking long walks on his own. He was still searching for something. It was the summer of 1940. News of Japan's bloody civilian massacre in Nanjing was just reaching the world. 300,000 civilians had been slaughtered by sword and club in three months. 
The report said Japanese soldiers spent each day chopping off heads until they could no longer lift their arms. Children and women were not spared. It was only a matter of time until the American forces in the Philippines would feel the sting of Japanese steel. On one of his long walks, John's path in life once again suddenly became clear to him, just as Father Russo said it would. The threat from the Japanese that he had foreseen in his two visions was now clear. The call to his warrior spirit was overpowering. As abruptly as he had left his last job and moved from New Jersey, he enlisted in the Marine Corps. On July 11, 1940, John Bassalone entered the Marine base at Quantico, Virginia. The base was a Spartan arrangement of wood frame barracks and obstacle courses. The air was heavy with humidity and thick with mosquitoes. When John told his mother that he had joined the Marines, he said, The Army was too soft, Ma. I'm going with the Marines. Marines have always prided themselves as being the toughest and first to fight. This attitude fit with John's personality exactly. He threw himself into his training. There was no going back to civilian life. He had found the warrior's path he had been seeking for so long. Under the command of General H.M. Howling Mad Smith, John shipped out from Quantico for amphibious assault training at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Congress had begun to mobilize the armed services against the growing Japanese threat in the Pacific. Clearly, the two countries were on a collision course. Others were now seeing the vision John had seen years before. It was clear that the Marines, the ground force of the U.S. Navy, were going to be the force that would meet the threat. A new facility was commissioned for the special training of this elite seagoing invasion force. 100,000 acres of snake-infested swampland at New River, North Carolina, became John Bassalone's new home. John may have begun to feel like the Marines were receiving the type of neglect he had experienced in Manila with the Army. Conditions at the new base were primitive. In October 1941, at New River, John Bassalone met the mentor who would teach him the lessons of the modern warrior. Major Louis B. Chesty Puller, who would receive five Navy crosses in his career and become an enduring legend in the Marine Corps, was assigned to command the 1-7. December 1941. The Japanese crushed the Americans in the Philippines. They ran the British out of Hong Kong and seized the Dutch East Indies. On December 7th, the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor nearly wiped out the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Australia was in the Japanese crosshairs, and America's west coast was vulnerable to attack. The time had come. The vision John Bassalone had years earlier on a peaceful golf course was now a fact. Chesty Puller's 1-7 Marines, with newly promoted Sergeant Bassalone, had been training continuously for over a year. They were considered an elite unit, one of the most likely to lead the counterattack against the Japanese in the Pacific. Across America, citizens were enraged at the sneak attack and wholesale slaughter of Pearl Harbor. Entire populations of young men from towns and cities volunteered to slap a Jap and teach Tojo a lesson he wouldn't forget. Soldiers and Marines weren't seen as government thugs or layabouts anymore. They were now the new heroes. The day of the warrior had arrived. In spite of the warrior's new popularity, the early days of the war were a string of defeats for America on land and sea, including the humiliating loss of the Philippines. One of the Solomon Islands, called Guadalcanal, was the place where America would draw the line. If the Japanese could not be stopped at Guadalcanal, then Australia, our ally, would be next in line for conquest. One small airfield, Henderson Field, would be the turning point in the war. It became the job of 26-year-old Sergeant John Bassalone and his 12-man squad to hold the center of the defensive line protecting Henderson Field. The arrival on Guadalcanal on September 18, 1941, of Sergeant Bassalone's battalion, the fearsome 1-7 Marines, was a quick and brutal lesson in the changing fortunes of war. In the first combat action against the Japanese at the Matanakau River, several companies of the 1-7 were trapped behind enemy lines on a hill overlooking the river. Learning that his men were trapped, Puller disobeyed orders, left his second in command to hold the 1-7's position, and commandeered the naval destroyer Ballard. He personally directed the ship's fire and then led the rescue party in small boats to the beach for his men. Approaching the heavy incoming fire from the beach, 
the Coast Guard coxswain driving Chesty's boat started to turn back. Chesty threatened to shoot the man with his 45 if he didn't keep going. The boats made the rescue under heavy fire. Chesty commanded from the front lines. He disdained leaders who sent commands from the safety of a command post. John studied and learned from Chesty's example. To be an effective leader, you had to be up front with the men doing the fighting. It was soon his turn to apply the lessons under fire. The Japanese Pacific commanders now realized that Guadalcanal was the spearhead of the American counterattack. Guadalcanal had to be retaken at all costs. The battle for the Pacific would be decided along a one-mile ridge that rose 50 feet above the jungle, forming a natural barrier in front of Henderson Field. John Bassalone commanded a 12-man squad in two gun emplacements approximately 40 yards apart in the center of this one-mile perimeter. As night fell on the night of October 24th, the Japanese attacked. For the next three nights, always starting around midnight, after aerial and long-range artillery bombardment, the Japanese attacked all along the 2,500-foot ridgeline. Sergeant Bassalone's squad of 12 men, including himself, were in two fighting holes in the center of the ridgeline, a natural pathway over the ridge. Hundreds of attackers focused their fire, including grenades, mortars, and TNT against the men. The Japanese, covered in camouflage leaves, looked like the jungle was coming up the hill. They were cut down by the dozen. They fell back under the marine fire, reformed their lines, and charged again. By the end of the first night, the piles of Japanese bodies covered the sides of Bloody Ridge. Four of Sergeant Bassalone's squad had been killed. Several more were wounded. General Hayukotake had suffered the first defeat of the Japanese land forces in 2,000 years on September 14th against Edson's raiders on Bloody Ridge. He was commanded to return to the scene of a shameful performance and redeem himself, or never return. The Japanese attacked again at midnight. The first wave of over 600 men rushed the American Marines climbing over the bodies of their comrades who had fallen the night before. At about 4 a.m., the Japanese finally broke through the Marine lines between Sergeant Bassalone's two positions, forming a salient 50 yards deep and 75 across. Sergeant Bassalone's men on his right flank were wiped out. He and his remaining men were now surrounded. Because his wool socks itched, Sergeant Bassalone fought barefoot. Three times he ran through enemy lines to bring more ammunition, water, and new gun barrels back to his men. By the time the Japanese broke through the American lines, only Sergeant Bassalone and two other men of his unit were still alive. He had lost nine men. Bassalone fired one machine gun until it was empty, rolled to the second, and kept firing while the first was reloaded. 38 Japanese were killed at close range and in hand-to-hand -hand combat around Sergeant Bassalone's position. Chesty Puller brought his reserve unit of the 3rd Battalion of the U.S. Army's 164th Regiment against the break in the line. With mortar teams placed on either side, the Japanese incursion of 35 soldiers was wiped out and the defensive line restored. When the sun came up on the third day, Sergeant Bassalone and his men had held the line, Henderson Airfield remained in U.S. hands, and 1,462 Japanese soldiers were dead inside and outside the perimeter wire, including a total of 150 in and around Bassalone's position. Captured Japanese soldiers indicated another 500 dying and injured had been carried off. Within days, Commanding General Hayukatake also committed suicide in shame for his second defeat. The tide of the war against Japan had turned. After Bloody Ridge, Japan would never win another land battle against the United States, but they would make the Americans pay dearly for every inch of land. Sergeant Bassalone and the men of the 1-7 went on the offensive after Bloody Ridge. For the next 18 days, they retraced the jungle route of the retreating Japanese and attacked them at their bases beyond the Matanikau River. By late November, all of Guadalcanal was under U.S. control. Of the 4,262 men who landed with John Bassalone on Guadalcanal, 93 never left, including all but two of John Bassalone's squad. Over 2,500 Japanese soldiers, half of their total force, were killed in the Battle of Bloody Ridge. On January 1, 1943, the remaining Marines of the 1-7 boarded a ship bound for Australia. They were shipped to Melbourne, 
where they were hailed in the local papers as the saviors of Australia. It was said that every home and every bar in Melbourne was open to any American Marine. It was a month-long party and love affair that taxed the men's recovering strength. He developed a habit of heavy drinking that often exceeded a quart of liquor a night. To announce his encumbered state to the world, he wore his cap or piss cutter sideways when drinking. It became part of his legend, like the title Manila John. On May 21st, 1943, Sergeant John Bassalone was awarded the United States highest honor for a fighting man. He received the Medal of Honor at Balcombe, Australia. But paradoxically, John Bassalone's great achievements as a warrior would bar him from the fight. He was not even allowed to train men in all that he had learned about jungle warfare. Although some of the toughest fighting in the Pacific was still ahead, for John Bassalone, the war was now over. John was the first nationally celebrated war hero of World War II. He was shoved into the public spotlight and overnight became a national icon. Sergeant John Bassalone, I'm very happy to welcome you and we're very proud to have you in New York City. Tell me, Sergeant, are those Japs really tough? Yes, sir, the Japs were tough, but the Marines were tougher. I just happened to be there and anyone would have done the same in my place. America had a need equal to its need for heroic warriors. It needed money. It needed salesmen for war bonds. He was assigned a tour with the third war bond drive. The goal of the drive was to sell $15 billion worth of war bonds. With them were the movie stars Virginia Gray, Eddie Bracken, and John Garfield. But the people came out to see John Bass alone, a real live war hero. John was never a confident public speaker, his hands shook and he forgot what he was supposed to say when the time came to speak. The life of a celebrity was torture to him. At the end of the one-month sales drive, from September 9th to October 2nd, 1943, the drive brought in 107% of its goal, almost $19 billion. By the end of it, John had had enough of public life. When asked if he was thinking about a career in movies after the war, he commented, Movies? <laughs> I'd hate to have to do that for a living. Even before the war bond drive started, John had been agitating to return to his men. All his requests had been denied. He was too valuable as a war bond salesman, a job description he was beginning to hate. There was one type of guy who annoyed me on these tours. He's the sort who buttonholes you in a slop shoot and asks, what's that blue ribbon with the white stars you're wearing, soldier? They usually call you soldier and not a marine, especially in the Middle West. I answer, why, that's for good conduct. Then this guy, if he's middle-aged, always starts blowing smoke up your trousers about the First World War. If he's fairly young, he starts crying on your shoulder about how he has tried and tried to get in the armed forces, but he always gets turned down because a housemaid's near adenoids or something. At a war bond rally in New York City at the Waldorf Astoria, John ran into his former commanding officer on Guadalcanal, Lieutenant General A. A. Vandergrift. He had only one thing on his mind, getting back to his men, and got right to the point. Sir, there's still a big job to be done over there. How would it be if they take back Manila and Manila John isn't there? Sir, I want the fleet. I'm no Navy Yard Marine. Vandergrift, who had clasped the Medal of Honor around John's neck in Australia, said he would see what he could do. It would take some negotiation. John Bassalon was still more valuable as a salesman than a Marine. The bond drive continued. The Bassalone Day Parade in his hometown of Raritan, New Jersey, drew a crowd of 35,000 people. He insisted that this event start with a service by Father Russo at St. Anne's. Over 35,000 people crowded the main street to cheer their hero. The parade ended at a field John had played in as a boy. He stood on the temporary stage and spoke to the townspeople who had known him all his life including those who had given up hope that he would ever make anything of himself. Just a month after it started, the tour was over, and the spotlight turned away from John Bassalone. He was assigned to guard duty at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. He'd become the very thing he disdained, a Navy Yard Marine. He felt useless. He suffered a special type of loneliness that only fighters who have lived through intense combat feel. He suffered with nightmares of bloody hand-to-hand -hand jungle combat and the loss of his men. His drinking increased, some nights to over a quart of liquor. He was once again lost in a world that had cast him aside. 
after he heard the reports of the desperate battle at Peleliu, where Chesty Puller and the 17 were nearly wiped out, he walked into the office of his commanding officer at the Navy Yard and demanded to be returned to active duty, to be with his boys. He would rather face court-martial than return to his guard shack. He told his commanding officer, Sir, I'm staying with my boys. They need me. News of the pending mutiny of America's greatest war hero raced up the chain of command. Within a week, John Bassalone received his orders to report to Camp Pendleton, California, where he would command a machine gun platoon. He was given three days to put his affairs in order before shipping out. He returned to Raritan to say his goodbyes. As he had done since he was a young boy, he gathered his thoughts on the quiet fairways he had grown up on near his home. For the third and final time, he received a clear vision of his future. He would not be returning from combat. His number was up. We were all talking, my father, and I guess my mother was there too, and a couple friends and I, and whoever. He said, I'm not gonna come back. I said, come on now, come kid. And that kind of bothered me for quite a while. And he was right. Then I was getting the feeling that when, I, when he left that day, when he finally said goodbye, and I had the feeling I wasn't going to see him anymore, too. I saw that the bother me for a while. In spite of the vision of his death that he carried with him, John Bassalone returned to his beloved Marines at Camp Pendleton in high spirits. You don't know what a thrill it was to me to walk into one of these battleship gray barracks at Pendleton and see a long line of machine guns parked in the aisles between the bunks. I felt like kissing the heavies on their water jackets. John had once again been returned to where he belonged, with his Marines. Perhaps hoping to compress a lifetime into the next few months, John Bassalone married Lena Rigi, a Marine sergeant and head cook at the Marine Mess Hall at Camp Pendleton. The wedding was held on July 10, 1944, in Oceanside, California. Married life lasted exactly one month. On August 11, orders came down that the Marines were to be ready to ship out at 0600 the next morning. John was now part of the 5th Marine Division. Their first destination was Hilo, Hawaii. In a dusty volcanic bowl known as the Gobi Desert of Hawaii, the division made their temporary home at an outpost named Camp Tarawa. The camp was 12 miles from the city of Hilo and only accessible by a small gauge railroad. In this total isolation, the Marines concentrated on physical conditioning and training with new weapons, including the flamethrower and pipe rocket, or bazooka. The men had only each other for companionship and entertainment. As he had done with Chesty Puller and the 1-7 on Guadalcanal, John Bassalone and his men shaved their heads. They called it going Asiatic. John was very cavalier, almost dashing, like Victor Mature, the movie star he resembled. He was very concerned about his men, and he did consider them his men. Private John Littlefield. Four months after they had arrived, the orders came down. The 5th Division, including Bassalone's C Company of the 27th Regiment, were shipping out, destination officially unknown. Two days out of Pearl Harbor, the destination was revealed in an announcement over the ship's loudspeaker. The news must have been no surprise to John, but the dark vision he had of his future must have gotten even darker. The invasion of Iwo Jima was codenamed Operation Detachment. It included over 800 warships and transported the largest marine invasion force ever to go into battle, over 70,000 troops. The total manpower of all forces involved was over 250,000 men. Unlike all the other battlegrounds of the Pacific that were covered in dense jungle foliage, Iwo Jima was a barren volcanic rock that stunk of rotten eggs, a reminder of its sulfurous origin. The name Iwo Jima in Japanese means Sulphur Island. Iwo Jima was the only island large enough between the American airfields in the Marianas and Japan that could accommodate the huge new B-29 bombers. It had to be taken for the Japanese mainland to be attacked by air. The first wave hit the beach at 9 a.m. on February 19, 1945. At first, there was only sporadic sniper fire, enough to keep the first men pinned down on the tiers of black sand. They were under the gun sights of the enemy, hidden in Mount Suribachi above them on their left. Wave after wave of Marines landed and were piled up on the beach. 
the heavy tanks and armored amphibious transports sunk in the loose sand. So far, the Japanese plan was working perfectly. From their vantage point, the Japanese could read even the insignia arm patches on the Marines' sleeves. They opened fire on the clustered Marines below. The slaughter was horrific. Groups of men were blown apart by single Japanese shells. The invasion of Iwo Jima was stalled. The Marines frantically began to dig in, all except one. John Bassalone stood up and pulled men out of the sand by the collar. He kicked them in the pants and screamed at them to move inland. The men ran over the banks inland to shell holes in the sand for cover. The invasion of Iwo Jima continued. I only saw two men standing up. Everybody else was in the prone position. And the two Marines were, one of them was John Bassalone and the other one was our Colonel that uh, warned him who was the uh, executive officer of the 1st Battalion of the 27th Marines. And uh, they were the only two standing up, walking. And Bassalone doesn't even have his helmet buckled. He's got a light pack and a carbine. But he's kicking people in the butt, you know, s screaming, get up, get it going. You're going to die on the beach if you don't get going. And about that time, the bombardment started. But it, at first, when you look back, it was absolute quiet. Nothing had happened yet. And I thought, I thought well, the Japanese got scared and left. <laughs> no such luck. A gun emplacement in front of the men was cutting them to pieces as they moved across the wide beach toward their first objective, Motoyama 1 Airfield. Sergeant Bassalone formed an attack team of men from different units who were scattered across the beach. They attacked the gun and destroyed it, saving countless lives of his boys. And Bassalone sees them. I got a machine gun, and he he gives me the instruct. He said, "Go in." He gave me the signal to go in and to uh, go into action on a target. But I couldn't see the target. But by looking down his arm, I could see he was pointing at the aperture of a Japanese pillbox. I could see the steel plates of it and they would open it up and shoot. Now they were shooting down the beach into the fourth division. They weren't shooting out the sea, they were shooting down the beach. They had guns at both ends shooting both ways. And uh, I try and go into action, Steve, and the machine gun doesn't work. So right there in the middle of all this, I have to rail, Steve has to get the toothbrush out. Well, this high-tech weapon, <laughs> cleaning weapon, we clean the breach out of the volcanic sand with a toothbrush. Well, we put it back in and put the breach in and opened fire. But the bullets, the tracers, aren't hitting just right. So Bassalon has us move the gun oblique to the right. So we got a, a direct field of fire into the aperture of it. And uh, now then they, they've got the aperture closed because we're shooting right into it. You can see the tracers hitting it. And uh, from somewhere, he finds a demolition man, one of B Company demolition men. And the demolition man takes his satchel, his composition C2, and I keep firing and he walks right up the line of fire, right alongside it. That's a technique they learned. And when we got, when he got about 10 feet away, Barcelona hit me on the helmet to stop firing. And the guy ran and slung it because they, the satchel has hand, uh, straps on it that you can actually sling it. And he slung it up there and it hit the bottom. When it exploded, it blew the doors off the pillbox. So Bassalone gets me and, you know, start firing again. And now I'm shooting inside the pillbox. You can see the tracer. Now this is a giant pillbox. <laughs> you know, probably the doors were six foot tall or something like that. Because they ran, they run the gun up there and shoot and then run it back. And, uh, the uh, tracers are going in there now, and then he finds a guy named uh, Peg, who was our, a Corporal Peg. And Corporal Peg was the flamethrower guy. And he walks the same line of fire till I get up there, and then I quit firing. Basil makes me quit firing, hits me again. He <laughs> walks up there and uh, gives it a couple of squirts of that napalm. And all of a sudden, Basilum gets a straddle on my back, and he unhooks the pinnel to the machine gun and grabs, it had a bale, called the Basilum bale. 
and he picked it up and then he re leans over and screams and hollers in my ear, get the belt. Because no one, you can't fire it unless somebody directs the belt into the machine gun. And he takes off running and I'm falling with the belt in my hands like this. And we get up to the top of this parapet there. And down below was this lower deflated area where the Japanese entered the pillbox. And as soon as we get there, these Jap all these Japanese soldiers come running out and they got napalm all over them. And Baselon takes the machine gun and mows them down as they come out. After destroying the blockhouse and directing tanks through a minefield while under fire, John Baselone led his men to the edge of the Motoyama airfield. They had achieved their objective. The invasion of Iwo Jima would continue. He had saved many of his boys. He returned through the killing fields of Iwo Jima's infamous Red Beach to bring reinforcements up to his men on the airfield. On the return trip, a mortar shell landed at his feet. Madilla John died on the beach, his final mission accomplished. I couldn't tell you in real time what it was. Could have been 15 minutes, could have been an hour. We look across there just where we came. And here's Bassalone leading some Marines. And all of a sudden you can hear the shrill of the incoming rounds mortar. And one of them lands among them. Killed Bassalone and five of his men. His men wrapped him in a poncho and moved his body to the road they now controlled. From all over the beachhead, GIs came to see their hero. They cried without shame for their fallen hero. For his actions that day, Sergeant Bassalone was recommended for a second Medal of Honor. He received the Navy Cross for Valor and the Purple Heart. Shortly after his death, the United States Navy honored his memory by naming a destroyer the USS Bassalone. The Marine Corps enshrined the name of Bassalone throughout their bases. A stretch of Interstate Highway 5 near the Marine base of Camp Pendleton in Southern California bears his name. Recently, several states have proclaimed February 19th as John Bassalone Day, and Raritan, New Jersey celebrates this day with a parade in his honor. In 2005, the United States Postal Service will commemorate his heroic life with the issuance of a postage stamp. John Francis Bassalone followed the three prophetic visions that guided him on his path. Even when the destination was death, he walked the path, a warrior and protector of warriors to the end. Thank you.